welcome to tonight's event, A Sociologist's Perspective, Lifespan and Aging, the Psychology of Hate Groups, and more with Dr. Emery Smith. Emery Smith, PhD, has been a researcher who talks about lifespan and aging, about hate groups, where he actually attended Nazi and skinhead meetings at his peril to conduct research and has directed his research to devise ways to better allocate resources to improve student access in measurable ways. He has worked to identify students who suffer from intergenerational poverty and hypothesized that they face unique barriers to success and that this group cuts across racial and ethnic barriers. Uh, Emery, when we were talking, Prior to the uh, event, uh, you were telling me your journey about where you were before you got your PhD, how you got it, and what drove you to the field that you are in. I uh, dropped out of high school uh, in the ninth grade. I made it through the ninth grade because in Montana, you had to uh, make it through the ninth grade to get your driver's license when you were 15, or I would have had to wait till I was 16. And that's the only reason I got through the ninth grade. Uh, didn't care for high school. Uh, worked uh, all kinds of different uh, labor jobs. Uh, I was uh, born in 1954, and my draft number, those of you that are old enough to remember the draft, my draft number uh, was was uh, for, through 43, I think, and they were taking through 67. So I was going to go to Vietnam. And so I uh, enlisted in the Navy uh, and was air crew, was a sub hunter, aviation anti-submarine warfare operator. Uh, probably one of the best things I did with my life. It got me out of town and uh, got me some education benefits. Uh, after that, I uh, went to a couple of trade schools. I went to heavy equipment operating school and operated uh, heavy equipment in uranium mines and road jobs, and then uh, went to heavy heavy equipment uh, diesel mechanic school so that I could fix the things that I was breaking and uh, worked uh, doing that for a while. And then I got a chance to uh, go to work uh, managing a convenience store for really good money. And so I did that, but I noticed everybody who was getting ahead of me uh, had some kind of a degree. So I decided to, to take a college class. I took a psychology class uh, at Central Wyoming Community College, and I loved it. I just loved it. I uh, got an A in the class uh, and decided I wanted to go to college. So I managed to work my way uh, back up to Billings, where I grew up, and started going to college at Eastern Montana College, which is now MSU Billings. Uh, wanted to be a psychologist. And then I kind of re realized I worked with some psychologists and I realized all the psychologists I knew were a little weird. I didn't know whether weird people wanted to psych or he went into psych and it made you weird, but I wasn't taking any chances. So I switched to sociology. What I found out is that uh, weird people go into psych and get weirder and sociology. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, sociology has just helped me make sense of the world. Uh, quite often we feel like uh, we're being buffeted around by life and we don't have control over the, the circumstances in our life. And I wanted to understand that better to find out what it is uh, that I do have control of. And one of the main uh, concepts of sociology is what they call the sociological imagination, you know, the sociological perspective. And the idea behind that is that uh, there are macro issues, very large issues that we don't have control over, but they do affect us. Uh, I would not be a veteran if it had not been for the draft in the Vietnam War. That was not my choice. Uh, but bigger things were going on than me, and I kind of got caught up in it. So it empowered me, uh, sociology empowered me to be able to understand better why I was getting buffeted around and then what I can do about it. And the main thing for me that I could do about it was get an education. And uh, so I decided to uh, get a PhD in sociology and become a college professor. And I managed to do that. It took a long time. I graduated uh, from my bachelor's degree in 1990 and finished my PhD in 2000. And then uh, went on to do research uh, for the Oregon Social Learning Center and the Oregon Survey Research Lab and the Northwest Survey and Data Services. And so I've done a lot of, of quantitative and qualitative research. Uh, and I guess that's about it. Uh, the thing with my dissertation was I... Uh, I was interested in uh, skinheads because I had a uh, niece who was on the streets of Spokane, a runaway from home, and she was on the streets of Spokane, and uh, she was hanging, I had heard she'd hang out with skinheads. I happened to be working at that point uh, for the uh, Census Bureau, so I was on the streets too, and I saw these skinheads kind of in action. And uh, one of my mentors, uh, my main mentor in sociology said, uh, he was just throwing out topics for a, a capstone project paper. And he said, why are there skinheads? And the first line of my dissertation is where the hell did all these skinheads come from? 
Uh, that was a quote from a Nazi. And uh, the, uh, it, it very much interested me because I could not understand how people could think the way these people think uh, and why they were doing the things they were doing. They were violent. Uh, they drank a lot. Uh, they told stories about it. And so what I did was uh, I wrote a paper about it and I called it The Shaved Head, which is a class in extinction. And uh, uh, got an A and uh, graduated. And then I continued in that vein uh, just, it seemed like it was such a, a, at that time, fresh new topic. Uh, and, uh, at least to me and nobody had really gone and, and actually talked to these people. Nobody had actually found out what it was they were about. So I went to the Washington state university library where I heard they had had an Aryan nations as uh, Northern Idaho. It was the organization that, that put together, uh, Nazis and Klansmen and skinheads. And uh, they put me in a room and locked it and wouldn't let me do anything but take notes. I couldn't make copies. They were scared half to death. And a couple of anthropologists had gone up there and got these, came back and dropped the project completely. So I realized nobody had really talked to these people. Uh, and so I decided that's what I would do. Uh, made friends with a guy in Montana who had been to the Aryan Nations compound, uh, got an invitation to go up there and went up there and started doing my, my field research, talking to people, doing interviews, and that type of thing. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of where, how I got where I am. Uh, I'm retired now, but that's how I became a college professor and developed the interest in the things that I've got. So, Wow. So how did you navigate attending these potentially dangerous meetings while maintaining objectivity and staying safe? Oh, that's, that's a really good question, Jeff. <laughs> One of the things that that uh, I realized right away is that it could be a very dangerous thing. And uh, my human subjects committee made me uh, create a form that said, if you tell me about anything illegal, I will report it. And uh, it was, you know, to protect my subjects. And so uh, I didn't go in undercover. I didn't go in pretending I'm I'm something that I wasn't. I didn't pretend I was one of them. I told them what I was doing. And they saw me as sort of like uh, semi-friendly uh, media. And the, they felt like the media had done them dirt, but maybe I wouldn't. And so the first thing that I did in order to be safe was I went to the head guy, a guy named William Butler, or I'm sorry, Richard Butler, and said, you know, I want to do this research. Do I have your okay to do it? And uh, he said, yes, you do. And told everybody there to, to give me carte blanche, give me whatever I needed because I was going to tell their story the way they wanted it told. That leads into uh, the objectivity part of it. Now, the safety part, that was primarily it. That didn't always work. I had some skinheads uh, decide, they, called, they told, said I was a, a Jewish psychologist and uh, then proceeded to about 200 to yell at me. And uh, I ended up having to leave the compound that day. Uh, Richard Butler kicked them off the compound for, for treating me that way. But it was scary. It was really scary. Um, I was, uh, I, I decided to head home after that. And then I was sitting at a gas station uh, and I saw a family, uh, a family that was brown, that wasn't white, and they were so happy and they were so glad to be together. And they were having such a good time that I put my stuff back in my car and I went right back up to Aryan Nations and uh, finished doing my, my weekend's research. So uh, as far as the objectivity, there's kind of a myth that, that uh, scientists can be absolutely objective and every scientist is engaged uh, in their work and invested in it and they want to be right. And so it's, you can't do it completely without values. The thing is to be able to recognize those. So what I did was I, uh, I realized that I wanted to tell their story the way they thought it ought to be told. Because uh, a guy named Leonard Zeskin said, uh, the two things to understand about, about uh, Nazis. Number one is Nazis are human people. They have problems just like everybody else. Uh, they have issues. They have fears, hopes, just like everybody else. And the second thing he said was fighting Nazis can be fun. And so I took those two things to heart. And so uh, what I did was I would go, uh, for instance, uh, when I did observations, I would do observations, take all the notes, write them all up, and then go to one or two people that I considered key people who had been more or less observing, hadn't really participated, and said, do you think I got this right? I did not give them uh, permission to edit or anything like that, just to tell me what they thought. And I did uh, multiple interviews, over 30 interviews in people's homes and uh, at Aryan Nations, cross lightings. They don't call them cross burnings, by the way. Uh, they know they know you don't know what you're talking about if you're talking about burning a cross. You light mm -hmm. the cross because there's hope there. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the objectivity comes from uh, that's called the reflexive method to allow them to reflect on the conclusions that I had come to, and that allowed me to uh, make whatever changes uh, to make it a little bit more accurate, and hopefully have it be as as unbiased as possible. There's enough biased stuff out there about well about every group, but particularly about Nazis, skinheads, clansmen, you know, uh, organized racists. 
uh, we needed some some real data. We need some real information about why these people are, are doing the things they're doing and what they're doing. And uh, so I, I thought I could add to the literature by doing that. Wow. And what surprised you? You were saying like, yeah, they have hopes, dreams like everyone else. What surprised you the most about their everyday lives and beliefs? I think uh, the most shocking thing I ran into was the children. Uh, they were raising these children. And uh, when I would go to the, some of their gatherings, the children would be hanging around and uh, maybe they'd be eating or something. And I would hear them talking and telling each other stories like uh, uh, that, that Nazis would tell. Like uh, they say we pushed all the Indians off into the ocean, which is what a six-year-old might think someone said, uh, you know, somehow. And uh, they knew to call it a uh, proselyting. They pronounced swastika, swastika. Uh, they were being socialized to grow up and become just like the, the rest of these people that, that, that they were hanging with. Uh, the community that they have, the communities, I should say, uh, that they have developed and that they work and live in, uh, that surprised me. There are places in Washington state where there are whole towns uh, that are probably 10% organized racists. Uh, Goldendale, Washington is one of them. And the reason Goldendale, Washington is that way is because their water source is above the town. So when the big one comes, they'll have water. And so uh, getting on the inside enough to realize that, that uh, they are really a, a, a culture, a subculture that uh, has resources, you know, and they help each other. And uh, there is, uh, there's a lot of fighting that goes on, a lot of, a lot of internecine violence and things like that. But generally, uh, they believe what they're saying. They believe in what, what they're, they're uh, trying to do. And they help each other do that. And that was the main thing. Uh, the other thing I think uh, that really surprised me was uh, where they were coming from. And they were coming from everywhere. Uh, the notion that they come out of prison and walk up to the Aryan Nations compound, that's true. That happened. But that wasn't where the majority of them came from. Uh, the more, majority of them uh, were actually pretty intelligent folks. Uh, quite a few of them are, are well-educated. Uh, that all kind of surprised me. I mean, it was just like, we have these stereotypes about them that don't help uh, deal with them and because they're not true. And uh, so to me, it was, I guess, I guess how human they were, you know, if I put it in a nutshell, there's really human people with human concerns. I actually liked a few of them, you know, and uh, that surprised me <laughs> because wow. some of them were folks, you know, uh, they told jokes that were funny uh when they weren't racist they told jokes that were funny they they took care of each other that that surprised me how did, and how did your firsthand experience uh influence uh your understanding of the evolution of racism and mm. how did it influence your you know how did it inform your research there's another thing that really surprised me was how uh aware of history they were they yeah. really, they knew their, I mean, if, if you didn't know who, I, I had to go study Nazi Germany so that I could know what the references were. Because even though I wasn't on the inside, I, I wanted them to know I'd done my homework. And uh, so it kind of surprised me that they knew uh, not only the history of, of uh, Nazis and Klansmen, uh, but they knew the history of skinheads. Uh, skinheads started actually in England uh, right after World War II. Uh, city that bombed out, there were no youth subcultures on the streets. So several emerged, and out of those subcultures is where skinheads came from. They knew that. Uh, there's a thing called, uh, George Marshall wrote a thing called the Skinhead Bible. All of them had read the Skinhead Bible and knew all of those things. Uh, the, the technology of how to actually <laughs> burn a cross so that it burns. You know, it, try that sometime. It's hard. That technology was something they shared with each other. Almost always, there is uh, there's social class involved. And uh, the first skinheads were uh, working class people. Uh, the reason they shaved their heads wasn't for fights. Uh, it, it eventually became that. But that's what coal miners did to keep themselves clean. Coal will get in. I worked in a coal mine once. Coal will get in between your toenails, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's to get the coal dust out. And so they were actually uh, working class people who were on the dole. They had been, uh, the, the coal mines had closed. The steel industry in England died. And so these were people whose fathers had worked in the mills and the mines and had done fine, and they couldn't. They didn't have that. And that's one of the things that we see fairly common is even if it's not true, they perceive that that's the case, that they're, that something's going on, that they're being replaced. 
And I think one of the things that I, I began to understand is that uh, there's a white labor aristocracy in our economy. And that white labor aristocracy was the kind, same kind of thing where you knew that uh, you could go get a job in the mill just like your father got a job in the mill, you could buy a house, you know, ever since the 50s, the most exceptional time in U.S. history. But ever since the 50s, you know, you could buy your house with the GI Bill or, or various, uh, you know, FHA loans and things like that. Uh, and that that was to be expected. And then things changed. And so there's there's fear there. You've uh, their fear being replaced. Uh, you saw that down in Georgia when the the uh, guys were with the tiki torches yelling, "Jews will not replace us. You will not replace us." Thirty years ago, they were saying the same thing. They just weren't saying it as loud or as publicly as they are now. Uh, and so I, it's it's a feeling that that they have of uh, of being replaced. And the other part of it that that uh, I found interesting was uh, they have set up their own sets of norms, their own sets of, of ideas about how people ought to behave. And so uh, once I learned those, then I, I could kind of get inside. But a lot of what's going on is they hate social change. And we are going through the most deep, rapid, profound social change humanity's ever gone through. Uh, the invention of the microchip has caused social change to go more rapidly than it has with any other technical change. And so we have a situation that Emile Durkheim, uh, he's a, a French sociologist back in the 1800s, he called it anomie. It's a sense of normlessness that when the rules change, you don't know how to behave. So I call my daughter and she says, Dad, why are you calling me? I said, well, because I want to talk to you. She said, text first. What? And she hung up. <laughs> so then I texted her and she, I said, are you busy? She said, no. And, and uh, then she calls me like, what is that? Well, we didn't have cell phones or texts or anything. I didn't know the rules, but people get confused. And and Durkheim called that anomie. And that's not just a sense of, of not knowing how to behave. It's a sense that the whole world is becoming unhinged and changing. I can't do the same things that I used to do. I can't, uh, uh, I'm, I'm confused and scared because not only has the culture changed, the ideas have changed, but the economy has changed drastically. You know, there, there's not as much physical labor as there was. Uh, there aren't a lot of jobs out there that don't require, you know, fairly high levels of education, whether they actually require them or not, they're, they're required to get the job. And uh, so these people feel like they're being left out. They're being left behind. And there is something to that. I mean, there's a little bit of truth to that. Every, every, every stereotype has a little bit of truth behind it. And so the fact that uh, they're really afraid that uh, they and their children are going to live in a world where they don't have any power. And I think uh, it was kind of an illusion that they did have some power at one time, and then they mm -hmm. fall. So. Are all Nazis skinheads? Are all skinheads Nazis? Is there a difference? Uh, that's a really hard thing to, to really uh, nail down. Uh, I differentiated them as, in, as being Nazis, and uh, there are various kinds of Nazis. There are the standard neo-Nazis that George Lincoln Rockwell kind of brought that into the United States. Uh, they believe Hitler was right. Uh, they believe the Jews are the spawn of the devil. Uh, and uh, are out to, to destroy the world. Uh, there's a lot of that. Uh, oh, I just got, <laughs> got sidetracked with another thought. <clears throat> yeah, excuse me, I'm, I'm getting over a cold. <clears throat> um, I think the the uh, the thing to to be able to differentiate them is more to do with their ideology. Uh, where Nazis believe Hitler was right, the Klan. Uh, is the other division uh, that I decided I would differentiate them. And it is actually pretty well accepted now. Uh, the Klan is, it, they can be Nazis or probably not. Uh, but uh, the Klan, they're the Christians for the most part. Almost all of them are Christians. Uh, where the Nazis will be all kinds of different religions. Uh, and the Klan, uh, they believe uh, that the South will rise again. Uh, that just the standard old clan is pretty stereotypical. There is no no one clan. There are probably uh, forty or fifty different major clan groups around. So there's no United Ku Klux Klan or or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And so they're all small groups that are that are fairly disorganized. And and the third group was skinheads. And the difference with them was primarily cultural. Uh, skinheads were a little different than Nazis. Uh, they're looking to to uh, uh, start a race war, but they're not ready for it. Uh, the Klan just wants things to return the way they are. And skinheads have four different uh, things that, that are their currency of their culture. It's drinking, fighting, having sex, and probably most importantly, telling self-aggrandizing stories about that stuff. 
So those are the things that really make someone a skinhead and they tend to age out of it. I've met some skinheads that were old, 40, 50 years old, but the vast majority of them are in their, in their, their, their 20s, maybe their 30s, and they tend to age out of it. Uh, partly because it's it's so violent and uh, there's a lot of fighting goes on more fighting be between skinheads than the violence that they, that they visit on other people uh, and so those are the kind of the three main groups but they go back and forth and I'm sure there are other groups out there too uh, I would put uh, the new people that we see uh, the new groups that we see coming out they probably have a little bit different category they're more sophisticated there was a guy named Tom Robb years ago he was an, uh, a Klansman and a Nazi who wore uh, three-piece suits. Uh, he was very well dressed, very well spoken, and he said, "Don't go out there uh, and 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 screw up." He said, "What you want to do is don't get thrown in jail because come the race war, we're going to need you. And what you really want to do is go out and get on the school boards, get on the county boards, get elected to those local governing bodies, and then we can rule the world." And now, what are we seeing? You know, we're seeing a lot of that. This guy was right. I don't know if Tom Robb's still alive or not, but uh, uh, he he gave them that and said, "Do this." Uh, Lewis Beam was a very scary Klansman. Uh, one of the one of the two guys that really scared me in all my research. Uh, Lewis Beam said, "Don't talk about it. Don't do it in groups. Don't keep the literature around your house. Uh, go out and do this. It's called a Phineas Priest. Go out and do it individually." And we see a lot more of those individual people going out. This is not to do with school shootings. It's a totally different thing. But individuals mm -hmm. going in and doing those things, and they, they tend to have no connection, no, no, no visible connection to any of these groups. So it's, it's, uh, it's changing. And as, as cultures always do, it's changing. And I think it's getting more sophisticated. And I'm not sure, but I think there's probably a fourth category com coming up that really doesn't fit any of those. So, Wow. So when the older skinheads age out, then they stop practicing whatever the philosophy was. They grow their hair and they just kind of, it's like retiring. <laughs> uh, yeah, not exactly. Uh, I think the main reason they age out, uh, what I watched was uh, the adults would say to the skinheads at various meetings and stuff at a, at a Nazi church or whatever, they would say, uh, you guys, you need to stop going out on the streets and getting in trouble because you're going to get end up in jail. And I would hear the skinheads or talk to them later and they'd say, you know, what else are we going to do? You know, that's what we do. And so they kind of age out of it because they were more into it for the lifestyle and the culture, not really to, to change the world. And so uh, they tend to, uh, to grow up to be just kind of garden variety racists rather than organized racists. But mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't, they do kind of retire from, from the movement. Uh, but I don't think I, I have not met any of them. I've met a few of them. I, I can think of three uh, that I met that uh, they had gotten out of the movement. They call it the movement. Uh, they had gotten out of the movement and uh, were not involved in anything organized. But they, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they would. You would see them off doing something individually, like a Phineas Priest, to hurt people. Uh, so I, I think there's another category there, and and I'm seeing it more as it emerges that I can't really place these people in the, you know, I'm a sociologist, I categorize people, uh, and I can't really place them in any of the categories that I'm aware of, because they are more sophisticated. I think they're what Tom Robb would have wanted uh, to happen. And uh, I don't know what he would have called that. Did you encounter, besides the people that kind of age out, did you encounter any individuals uh, exhibiting signs of questioning or yeah. moving away from the extremist ideology? <clears throat> Yeah, um, I went, uh, the first time I went up to Aryan Nations, I heard that there was a guy who had been their information officer with his Nazi uniform, and uh, his name was Floyd Cochran. And uh, th they told me uh, that Floyd had left the movement because uh, they told him that he had a son that had a cleft palate. And one of the, the uh, persons up in Aryan Nations told him, well, come the revolution, we're going to have to kill him because he's genetically inferior. And this caused Floyd to, to pack up his stuff and leave. So I ran into him, found him uh, in a park in Coeur d'Alene. He was, was kind of staying in the bushes, staying out of sight. He was scared. Uh, and I asked him uh, a lot about that. I spent a lot of time with Floyd, interviewed him. I've got a lot of hours of tape from Floyd. Uh, and that was the main thing for him was he, he didn't want his his son to have to, to live that kind of a life. And uh, he certainly didn't want him killed because he had a cleft palate. And that's when he realized that the whole thing just wasn't going to work for him. Uh, there's another interesting story, and I don't remember the fellow's name. 
but uh, it's a guy that lived in Hollywood and he was a very violent skinhead and he kicked uh, a young gay man almost to death. Uh, they put razor blades in their boots and kicked him almost to death and uh, never got caught for it. But one day he had four children and he began to realize that he did not want them to grow up like, like he was. They didn't, he didn't want them to have to live this lifestyle, didn't want them to have to be violent. And, and so uh, he walked into the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles uh, to find out what he could do to get out of the movement and to help them. And there he was face to face with a guy he'd almost kicked to death. Uh, there's a video out there on YouTube called Blood Brothers. They traveled around the country uh, doing presentations. They became friends and traveled around the country doing presentations. But I think the main thing, uh, if they're oriented, more oriented toward the future, and I think when when children show up, that's one of the main impetuses for them to get out. Uh, I also know a skinhead up in Portland that uh, he got he he didn't really want to leave. Uh, but he was getting so much bad press within the movement that he was afraid for his life. And so he sort of disappeared. Uh, actually, that's the guy uh, he uh, was involved in. in uh, if anybody remembers, uh, uh, Geraldo got uh, a skinhead through a chair and hit Geraldo in the nose and broke his nose. That's the guy that did it. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember that one. Yeah, it was yeah a he's, long been, he's been through a lot too, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so how can the research that you did your findings how can it be used to combat hate and promote dialogue across ideological divides that's one of the questions that, that that's difficult um i think if you if you look at the 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 uh, social class issues uh mm -hmm. and the fact that we're seeing such huge changes in our culture in our technology in our economy uh those i i see as the main causes of it and I'm not quite sure what you can do about that. I know education is huge. I know education is huge. Uh, many, many students that took my uh, race class uh, when I was teaching race, I taught that for 13, 15 years, I guess. Uh, and many of the students that came in had no idea uh, what race was. And uh, I would show them a film, it's called Race, the Power of an Illusion. Uh, the shows were 99% identical uh, as far as our, our DNA. Uh, which isn't surprising. We're forty percent identical with a banana, <laughs> but fruit flies have forty times more variation genetically than humans do, and they all look the same to us. Penguins have like three hundred times as much, and they all look the same. It just happens that that uh, the genetic differences between us happen to be very visible, and that makes it an easy thing uh, to label. Uh, you know, and there's there's another thing too, uh, not tolerating it at all. Uh, Edna Bonasic came up with a, uh, an idea called split labor market theory. And the idea there is that we have people that, uh, it goes back to kind of the white labor aristocracy idea. We have people that are uh, uh, doing fine and working. And all of a sudden they see people coming from some, usually brown people uh, or Irish people at one point uh, coming and they see them taking their jobs. And so what do they do? Then they attack those people. So, Part of it is uh, to actually uh, get people to talk to each other, you know, get people on both sides to sit down and talk to each other. And I have had that happen. I did a presentation in Seattle where uh, there are more anti-racist skinheads than racist skinheads. And the whole thing is kind of dead now. But uh, I was in Seattle doing this presentation at Seattle University and a bunch of racist skinheads walked in one side because I knew them from the streets and a bunch of anti-racist skinheads walked in the other side and they sat right in the front row, one on one half and one on the other. And I thought, oh, my God people are going to get killed today. And that wasn't what happened. They started talking to each other. And I don't know what happened after that, but they were talking to each other about their experiences on the streets and the things they had in common and, you know, why it was not okay to be a racist. And they all walked out and I don't think anybody got hurt, which was really surprising to me. Uh, part of it's about communication. And I think it starts uh, with non-racists understanding that they're not crazy. Racists aren't crazy. Organized racists are not crazy. Nazis aren't crazy. They have real concerns. And, you know, we all have concerns about the economy. Uh, you know, what are my what are my grandchildren going to be doing for a living? Nobody even knows what will be going on. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. Exploring those ideas and helping uh, them understand. I have had I actually had a, a two skinheads take one take my race class and they both said we're not going to be skinheads anymore halfway through the term they started growing their hair out and said we're not going to be skinheads anymore we didn't understand race and i think that that's a huge uh, issue that we have uh, around the world but particularly in this country so uh yeah yeah well hopefully there are courses like that out there 
Well, there are some, there are some, but you have to take them and you have to engage in them. So, yeah. Yeah. And I see a question from Bonnie. What is an anti-racist skinheads? Uh, the technical, uh, technically there, there isn't any group, but there was, there were several uh, skinhead gangs that called themselves skinheads against racial prejudice sharps. The original skinheads that, that uh, came off the streets, uh, began in the streets in London, they were not racist. They were classist. They did not like the middle class. They made fun of the middle class, uh, but they were primarily football hooligans, football spelled with a, a U and a umlaut. Uh, so mm -hmm. they were soccer uh, hooligans. A uh, guy, uh, Bill Burford, wrote a book called Among the Thugs, and uh, that gives you the lifestyle they lived in London. And so they weren't really uh, racist or anti-racist, but as racist skinheads began to emerge, uh, there's a huge history behind that, but as the, the racist skinheads began to emerge, that's when the anti-racist skinheads, many times these movements kind of uh, create and maintain each other, you know, the racist and anti-racist movement. If you didn't have racists, you wouldn't need anti-racists. And so that's kind of the way the Sharps came into existence was because as skinheads got away from the culture of being a skinhead and more into the politics of it, they got into the politics of the other side. So uh, that's an answer to your question. One answer, I'm sure there are many more. You moved on, uh, you know, throughout the years and you were doing uh, lifespan and aging <laughs> research. Uh, uh, so what are some of the uh, secrets to longevity? Like what are some of the... Uh, uh, you know, insights that you've gained about factors influencing lifespan. Anything surprise you? Uh, let me answer one question first, Jeff. Uh, James Hills yeah. asked. Uh, met one more. Okay. Uh, back in the old days, red shoestrings meant that you were not racist. White shoestrings meant that you were. Uh, and that's the boot strings. Uh, they were Doc Martin boots. <laughs> they, uh, doc, Dr. they had the Dr. Martin dental plan, they called it, that was kicking people's teeth in. Uh, and so the, the shoestrings were used, and uh, like a lot of the culture, that has kind of gone away. But one one time you could identify skinheads, whether they're racist or not, by the color of their, their uh, bootlaces. Uh, that only worked for a while. Uh, my first couple of years of research, I could could tell and interact with them based on that. And then they, it's it stopped being meaningful to them. So so go ahead, Jeff. Uh, wow, Doc Martin. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Martin <laughs> dental plan. Yeah, that, that was their joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, uh, as far as teaching human development, uh, what in, I think the most surprising thing to me is that if you live a healthy life, if you eat right and you exercise, you're probably going to live a little bit longer, but maybe only a year or two. The big difference in terms of how people age is that if you take care of yourself, you're much more likely to die quicker. That is, you're not going to spend 10 or 15 years bedridden with diseases what's going to happen is something's going to a disease or something will take you out much more quickly so it's not so much about lengthening life who wants to lengthen a life of misery it's much more about uh the uh uh the the quality of life that you have at the end toward the last when the old old ages you know 70 and up something like that so uh, that was the most surprising thing uh another thing uh that kind of surprised me was i had my students always every term I've sent poor, poor uh, rest homes, but I would have uh, all of my students, I had a couple of classes, I'd have 50 or 60 students in Roseburg, uh, uh, Oregon, uh, and they would go out and ask somebody who was over 75 years old, what is wisdom? Does everybody get wisdom? And I was surprised at the answers that, they, that I got and how few people really get wise when they get old. And the main component there for most people uh, when they answered that was wisdom is learning from your mistakes. You know, we all make mistakes and wisdom comes from learning from your mistakes and, and then changing. And so uh, that was another surprising thing to me that that I kind of had this idea that as you got old, you automatically got wise. And apparently it doesn't work that way. That's what a lot of wise old people told me. <laughs> wow. Well, can you reframe aging for us, debunk some of the common myths and misconceptions that, there, that are out there about growing older? Yeah, I think the biggest misconception is called disengagement theory. And disengagement theory is uh, the notion that at a certain age, you sit down. Uh, <laughs> why do we retire at 65? And we don't now because Social Security made that a year later. I retired at 66. So why do we retire at 65? Why is that the magic number? Uh, Otto von Bismarck, who was the premier of Prussia, which is now Germany, 
decided that because the labor market had young people coming into it and they couldn't find jobs that needed to do something uh, to get people out of the labor market. And so he decided at 65, then the state would start taking care of people to get them out of the labor market. There's really no biological reason for it to be 65. You know, we can we can work as long as we want to work. And and for the most part, uh, that's what people are doing now. They're working longer than these two, not because they have to, but the idea that that we sit down I had an uncle tell me, sit down. You want to get old? Sit down. You will. And boy, he didn't. He died out fishing and, you know, he never did get old. He was 82 when he died and he never did get old because he just kept moving, you know, but that's not all there is to it. Um, I think you were talking about one of your seminars is going to be on planning for, for later in life. And I think people plan their retirement based primarily on finances. They don't really plan what they're going to do with themselves. What are you, you know, did you, what dreams did you have? Uh, you talked about 61 years old, a little earlier, 61 year old getting a college degree. You know, uh, my father decided the retirement meant sitting down and he was miserable. Uh, he wanted to go back to work because he hadn't planned for the other things, the non, non-economic things. Uh, so for me, uh, what I do is I, I have always wanted to play music more. So I have an amplifier and guitars all over the place and, and I've been doing music uh, quite a bit. Uh, as much as I can. Uh, I also uh, wanted to do Tai Chi, learned to do Tai Chi. And so I've been doing Tai Chi now for four or five years, uh, partly because uh, there's a form of Tai Chi called the Yang 24 form, simplified Yang style. Uh, and the Chinese government contracted that so that elderly people could uh, uh, develop their balance and their flexibility better. And so that's part of it is, is the physical part it is economically, uh, we tend to take care of ourselves. The physical part, that will keep you from, from you know, dying miserably. Uh, and then uh, the other part is the social part. We know that uh, when men uh, get widowed, they live an average of two years after their wife dies. Women live eight to 12 years after their husband dies. And about the only factor they found that's universal or fairly universal is that uh, women maintain the social contacts men tend to get very lonely after the woman dies because she's the one that arranged the potlucks and, you know, uh, after church things and, you know, all those things. And if the man isn't, wasn't involved in that social life, then they become depressed and this can shorten your life. Apparently, uh, you know, although it's odd women, uh, females across all species live longer, but, uh, men don't live as long after they lose their partner because of that. So one of the things I think in, in terms of my aging in particular is that I have reached out to all of the relatives I lost track of. I had no idea I had so many cousins. Uh, I've been in touch with cousins. I spent last summer, took three weeks and went uh, through, Mont grew up in Montana, went through Montana and saw every one of my sisters. Uh, I keep in touch with my children. Uh, I just got, I, I barely made it in time here because I was taking my granddaughters, uh, getting one from school and taking her home. Uh, I am in touch with my children on a, at least every week. Uh, I watch one of my grandchildren on, on uh, he lives up in Portland. It's about two hours away. I watch him on Mondays and on Wednesdays and Fridays. I watch two beautiful granddaughters and that keeps me alive. Uh, I think it's huge to understand. It's, it's, it's about the economic thing. Uh, it's about your own personal health and everybody's aware of those two things, but, but being socially connected, having the social connections. And that's partly for support, but it's also just so that, uh, you know, you have somebody to care about. Somebody cares about you. I think that's huge. So uh, for those uh, in the audience, what kind of steps can uh, can me and our audience members take to promote healthy aging physically and mentally, emotionally, spiritually? <laughs> uh, spiritually, that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> if you know. <laughs> and that's something I did not bring up, but that is something I just else. threw it in. Yeah, that's, that's part of the social factor of it. But yeah, uh, spirituality is huge. Um, I thought, are you talking about individuals or what we can do to help others age? Uh, Grace, yeah, what advice can we give? Yeah, uh, <laughs> quit smoking. Uh, if you smoke cigarettes, quit smoking cigarettes. Uh, there is a lot to be said for just every day, do a little bit. You don't have to walk 5,000 steps all at once. 
you know, uh, you can split that up. They know now that in any kind of exercise, if you do 10 minutes of it for say cardio, 10 minutes, three times a day is as good as 30 minutes straight. And so, uh, that's part of it is to, to just do a little bit every, every day, just do a little bit every day. Um, uh, another thing that I think helps, uh, I have a very good physician and I do exactly what she tells me to do. Actually, I have several physicians now, but I do exactly what they tell me to do. Uh, I don't, uh, uh, try to cheat. Uh, you know, I'm not cheating anybody but myself. And so, uh, having that kind of an awareness of, of what my health issues are and what I can do, uh, to, to alleviate some of those things, uh, you know, kidney stones, uh, various health issues that, that we all have being aware of them and what can I do to, to make sure that they don't affect my life in a very negative way. Uh, I had a very serious, uh, uh neck injury, uh, back 30 years ago. And I finally got the insurance company to pay to fix it. And so that I'm out of pain. Uh, I didn't realize until I had that surgery and I said, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not feeling any pain. And she said, generally, you should be unaware of your internal organs. Oh, <laughs> okay. I'll try to be un unaware of my internal organs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if I feel something going wrong, you know, to get it fixed. As far as the social aspect, uh, I had realized that I, I was doing that, uh, that I had, had sort of withdrawn from my relatives and uh, the people that love me and was not willing to spend the time. So that's one of the things I went to my kids. Uh, neither of my children needs me to do, do daycare. They're, they both make more money than I ever made, but they want me involved. You know, they want me involved in their children and, and I want to be involved. I got some of those beautiful grandchildren you never want to see in, in all ways. Uh, and uh, I'm a part of that. I'm a part of that. Become a part of something. I think to tell people to become a part of something, uh, join clubs, uh, take classes, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, I have found a, a large uh, support community in the Tai Chi community here uh, because they're all, you know, in it for the same reasons. Uh, and it, it's a martial art, but it's not, not violent or anything. So, mm. so we have what's going on Beverly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, people tend to become more introspective and spiritual. Uh, generally it depends on the stage of life uh they 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 look at the old category now as young old uh middle old and old old and i think the young old people are are not uh, any more likely to become spiritual but as uh we tend to do uh in the middle stages we tend to do an assessment of our life you know was it worthwhile have we done good things uh what what could we do differently and so uh at that point, I think is is when more people is when older people tend to to become more spiritual and or more religious. And there there is a, a difference between a spirituality and religion. They don't necessarily go to church. Uh, they might find other ways to do that. Uh, meditation is is one way that I've seen that uh, people become much more intentional uh, through taking up meditation. I also have been doing meditation for quite a while. Uh, and the thing about meditation is that they have discovered is that it uh, it can actually change physically change your brain. It can change the amount of blood flow into the parts of your brain having to do with, with, with meditation. Uh, the neural pathways become thicker and more dense. Uh, there's a, neuro, uh, a neuroscientist here, uh, Marjorie, uh, Marjorie Walcott, that she was a, a neuroscientist. And so she went, to, she went to India four years ago and got touched by a guru. And she felt an electric shock go through her. So every morning for 40 years, she has been meditating for an hour. But she kept it a secret because all her fellow scientists wouldn't, wouldn't like it. And she finally decided to write a book. The book is called Infinite Awareness. It's fairly technical. But what she did was she talked to people who had been dead, electrically dead, no more neurological things going on that came back and talked about things that had happened while they were dead. So she began to, to, to understand that there's probably something bigger out there and that she wasn't just meditating in her head. She was tapping into what she called an infinite awareness. And I think people do want to tap into, I think people sense that more as they get older. Uh, we aren't as busy uh, chasing uh, jobs and, and things like that. And so I think that, that that's a huge thing is to be able to, to grasp that even if you haven't been spiritual, that there is something that can, can make your awareness larger and, and be more satisfying. So uh, Beverly, I think that uh, they 
uh, I think it's kind of the obvious, the, the opposite of what you're saying is what I'm saying is more people are, are pulling away from religion and getting into some kind of spirituality. That can mean a whole lot of different things. Uh, my wife is Native American. Uh, we do sweat lodges and sun dances and all those kinds of things. There are many different paths to spirituality that, that people, uh, that they're, uh, it, organized religion just doesn't do it for them. And so I, I think that, that it's kind of the opposite of what you were thinking there. So for the future of aging, uh, have you come across uh, exciting advancements or research directions that you feel most optimistic about in this field? I, yeah, I think uh, a lot of native spirituality is about healing. Mm -hmm. And I think that we all have uh, scars, emotional scars, uh, you know, various kinds of scars that uh, can hinder us from becoming, from reaching our full potential. And so I think becoming more aware of that. And so the, the areas that I've been looking at are, are trauma. Uh, they have realized just in the last 10 years how much effect trauma has on people. Uh, and there are two major types of trauma. There's event trauma and then developmental trauma. Developmental trauma is from your childhood. And complex trauma involves both of them. I think understanding that is huge. And there are two different avenues that, that seem to be going on. One is the, the therapeutic uh, Probably the biggest one is uh, Richard Schwartz is a guy who came up with a thing called internal family systems. And he has found a way just based on what his patients told him to tap into uh, what it is that that a part of you that was, uh, he looks at it as being created by some some sort of a, of a trauma. And that to be able to get in touch with those through this internal family systems therapy allows us to understand uh, what that trauma has done to us and to, and to be able to overcome that. Uh, sometimes, I mean, if you've ever said something mean that you didn't mean to, and then went, oh my God, why did I say that? Or done something that was just out of character. It's probably because something inside of you had you do that to defend yourself, even though whatever that, that, that trauma happened that caused that part of you to exist doesn't exist anymore. So I think, uh, the therapies, uh, around trauma are, uh, allowing, uh, elderly people to heal elders. We like to be called elders, <laughs> uh, allowing elders to heal uh, the things that, that hold us back from being uh, everything that we could be. Uh, the second area, uh, which is, is closely related, is a thing called epigenetics, a uh, very quickly burgeoning area of genetics. Trauma does not change your genome. It doesn't change your DNA or your RNA. What it does change, though, is how your genes express themselves. Let me give you an example. There are really only brown eyes and blue eyes. It's the only gene there is, but there's another gene that has a switch that turns on and off yellow. If you have green eyes, your, your eyes might change over your lifetime as that changes. So what that is, is a gene that, that tells other genes how to express themselves. And that's what epigenetics studies is those genes that uh, get passed on from one generation to another. Now, the, the first research of this was done on, on Holocaust survivors. They realized the children of Holocaust survivors had some of the same issues that the Holocaust survivors did. How did that get? And so they thought, well, it's because they raised them. Well, they found out that even if they had not, not the Holocaust survivors had not raised those children, they still had those same kinds of personality characteristics and things like that. So they realized this is getting passed on somehow through people's bodies. Uh, about eight years ago, I had a student do a, a, a independent study and he found everything that had been written about epigenetics ever. And it was a stack of papers uh, about an inch and a half deep. Uh, I started to do that again about two years ago, and the pile would be three feet tall at least. Uh, the amount of research that's done on that, it's, it's uh, really complex uh, biology and chemistry that um, most of it I don't even understand. But how is it that trauma affects us uh, in, in various ways uh, in terms of, of uh, anxiety, uh, depression, all those kinds of things? Uh, can have a, a connection to that to that kind of trauma. So I think the area of trauma is, and, and former trauma, uh, you know, for elders, is uh, is a, a huge area. Uh, there's also a, a lot more research being done on on the thing that I talked about earlier, which is, you know, why is it that that uh, uh, do we withdraw? We don't withdraw, you know. So there's research being done now on, on better research on how people can make their lives more meaningful, uh, and how they can can do the things that that I kind of mentioned, which you know. Uh, staying connected to people and trying to get that out to people. I think a lot of people still believe that, you know, you're 65, you sit down and it's just not the way people do it anymore. Uh, 
and uh, that's one reason why older is it's not that we're living that much longer matter of, fact, matter of fact lately we're not living that much longer but it's that we are taking care of ourselves better and getting people to understand that you'll live a better life if you do that and some people aren't going to anyway but uh as you get older i think it's easier to see that uh, how can we embrace and find purpose not only in the la latter stages of life but in all stages even mm. in the face of the challenge of aging um, and I guess this could be the last question because we're coming up on eight o'clock soon. Oh, are, are we going to be done? <laughs> I didn't realize. <laughs> um, the time flies. It, it, I think for young people, it's very difficult. Uh, they live in a very fast world. If you're over 50, it, it's, they live in a very fast world. Things happen so quickly. Uh, things are changing so rapidly. You have to buy a new phone every three or four years. Uh, you know, uh, just the the change that is so rapid uh, is very difficult for them to deal with, too, although they're in the middle of it. So they kind of do. I mean, uh, my two and a half year old granddaughter can can you know run an iPad. Uh, that's just the way they, that they have to live. And so it's a, a little more difficult for them. I think one of the things that, that can happen is things like this. Uh, we have the ability now to. Uh, communicate with so many people that uh, using this technology like we're using now and, and all kinds of other things out there in order to make young people aware that, you know, if you do uh, try to live some kind of a spiritual life, uh, if you do take care of yourself physically, um, I told my son about 20 years ago, put away a dollar a month, see what happens. He didn't. <laughs> so then maybe they're, you know, they're just not going to listen. Uh, but I think, uh, I think that that for younger people, uh, it's just to be there for them, for, for our, our part of it. I think for society, that uh, using the research that we have, using the, the, the stuff that we know from the research I've been doing over aging for the last 15 or 20 years, uh, being able to use that. So much of the research that gets done never, never gets to the public, never gets, uh, never, it's never useful. Uh, some of the research that I did with the Oregon Social Learning Center around children and, and, uh, how they, they, uh, how to, how to get children to behave without breaking their spirit and those kinds of things. Some of that research, uh, it, what it talked about was, uh, that, uh, young people to find meaning in their lives these days, it's got to be more concrete for them because so much of what they they are dealing with is ephemeral it's it's out there but it's not not really real so it's digital <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah. digital right? <laughs> Let's see who you yeah so the social economic status does play a major role it does play a major role it really does uh that's part of it so was there anything else oh i think that's it so Excellent. You know, well, thank you all. Thanks, everyone, for your questions and for coming tonight. And thank you, Emery Smith, for coming as well. Yeah. Uh, really enjoyed this talk, uh, really learned so much.